Beating the odds. Ryan Blair. Ryan Blair. Ryan Blair. Former guest himself, Ryan Blair. 29-year-old multimillionaire, Ryan Blair. Ryan is also a successful investor and business consultant. Take Ryan Blair. He's founded six successful companies, and he's only 30 years old. He's going to show you how to stop overthinking and start making millions fast. It wasn't always like this. What does the middle class have that the poor kids don't? My dad was an engineer. You know, he had a hundred thousand dollar a year job. We had everything. I had all kinds of fun stuff. You know, I had new clothes come school year. I had a go kart. I had bicycles. I was a privileged kid. The next thing you know, all that was stripped from me. When my dad got addicted to drugs, and we lost our house, we lost our cars, we lost the stuff. So um, I knew what it was like to lose it all and go from the middle class to poverty. I hated how society treated you, the bigotry, the way people judged you, how different the school was, how different the neighborhood was. I ran with gangs. I mean, the day to day was crazy. You know, I drank, I did drugs, I had to shoplift to eat, petty crimes to survive. There was a series of moments where, like, I knew it was all going to come to an end. Uh, I would either become a professional criminal, I would go to prison, or I'd get killed. My first encounter with Ryan uh, wasn't very positive. I was a gang investigator at the time. He, he was a member of a local street gang. He was more of an enforcer. He was a big kid. He was intimidating to other people. My contacts were with him were enforcing the law and taking him to jail. I was facing four years. I didn't think they'd give me the max four, but I knew that I was up against something. I'm sitting there, and the DA introduces me, says, Judge Perrin, um, Ryan Blair may not look like Ventura County's worst criminal, but he is. He's been involved with and he's influenced more crimes than what he stands here being sentenced for. And I knew that, uh, you know, I had to go the extra mile to get out of the situation. And the only hope that I had was that I influence him before he casts his sentence. And the only way that I could do that was to write him a letter. And I remember sitting there, writing it, throwing it away, writing it, throwing it away. I put everything I had into this letter. I told him I'm sorry, you know, that I acted out of anger, that I shouldn't have done what I did. He read the letter, and then he said, young man, uh, you should be writing in college, not in prison. They released me, and about eight hours later, I'm being picked up by my mom with my letters, my journals, everything I'd written in there, uh, and, you know, and I'm out. And then I remember this overwhelming feeling came over me that I had to call and let my old homies know I was out. I went down the back alley and walked over to a gas station and got in the phone booth and made the telephone call and let them know I was out. And I remember the guy on the other end says, we'll come pick you up. And I was right back in, right back where I started, except this time I had dirt and they celebrated me that night. I did a lot of things that I have to repent for. Um, stuff that, you know, that, uh, you know, I'm not comfortable sharing with anyone. I remember being in an abandoned house, kind of up in the middle of nowhere. You know, it was a friendly gang that I knew very well. And I went into the house, and we're all playing cards, and all of a sudden, just like this dark gloom comes over it, you know, and I felt like just this evil force just come, comes over it. And these guys come in, and they're there to take me out. There was like 20 guys, bats, guns, knives. I mean, everybody had weapons. And the guy says, you know, you graffitied my mom's house. And I was like, I, you know, I did not. Like, I wouldn't do that, right? You guys know where I live. This other guy comes walking from the back, and he's a guy who'd been to prison. He's a guy who'd murdered people. We knew him. And he comes walking from the back, and he gets, he, I could tell he's charging in, and he's going to just you know, make a show out of this. And he's going to prove a point. And so... I immediately pulled out my gun and I went right, you know, right to, toward his head and said, I die, you die. How close to death did I come? As close as I'll ever come. And that happens, it's like a slow motion type situation. You know, I'm thinking Randy Pennis, I'm thinking my mom, you know, I'm thinking about the good times that I had. It's a bit of a surreal, life flashes before your eyes. You get into this zone where, you know, 
you either make the right decision or the wrong one. I was fortunate enough that day that I was uh, protected and that I was armed and I made the right decision. And I kind of backed out of the house and kind of took some steps out. And as soon as I got to the door, I ran as fast as I could. I jumped every wall I possibly could. I had to distance myself from, from the people. You know, I had to change my environment. I had to get a job. I preoccupied myself with a job that filled all of my time, every waking minute of every waking hour. It was the only way I could leave the neighborhood without selling out, without them being mad at me. I had to get a job. First thing I did, I worked at a, a dry cleaner for about a day. I hated that. I collected cans, recycled goods. I worked at a wood shop. I did roofing. I did a lot of odds and ends. I learned what I didn't want to do. And then I got a job working uh, in a company that was starting to expand named Logix Development Corporation. My real intention when I took the job was I wanted to learn computers. All I would do was read every book on the subject. I would study them. I mean, I spent as many hours a day absorbing information about the subject of computers as possible because computers equaled my way out of my environment. The company was growing, so they, uh, they gave me a promotion to lead technician and then uh, supervisor and then manager, uh, and uh, I'd gotten raises with that. I bought a home, I bought a black BMW, I filled my life up with toys, and I got to thinking. Here I was back in the middle class at about 20 years old at the time, and I had more assets than my dad ever had, and I was like, who cares? You know, I want more than that. Most people in America today, they're so afraid to lose their little middle class status. They're so afraid of what their friends are going to think, they don't ever do anything. They sit in the same position for the rest of their life, and then one day it does get ripped away. I wasn't going to have that. So I leveraged my middle class status, my middle class wages, my middle class credit cards, my middle class everything, and I basically uh, took out loans and did everything I could to start my own business. 75000 a year. That was my number. That was my goal. And, you know, it took me about a good year till I hit that number. And then when I hit that number, I said, what about $750,000? Took me a couple of years until I hit that number. You know, then it was, what about $7.5 million? And then eventually I hit that number. And then it was about $70 million. And eventually I hit that number. And now it's about $700 million. And eventually I'll hit that number. I made the change from a common thief. To up close and personal with Robin Leach yeah. And I'm far from cheap I smoke stuff with my peeps all day Spread love, it's the Brooklyn way The Moet and Alize keep me pissy Girls used to diss me Now they write letters cause they miss me That's right It was actually Benjamin Franklin who said Most men die at 25 And we just don't bury them until they're 70 Martin Luther King is renowned for repeating that quote You know, you think about that That is the definition of the middle class you know, you're young, you don't know what to do, you get a job, same place where your friend works, you don't even love it, it's just good wages, or it's comfortable, or it's easy. Next thing you know, you get a girlfriend, you get married, you get a mortgage, you get some kids, and now you're stuck in a death cycle where you're, you're spending the majority of your awake time, the majority of your most valuable asset that you'll ever be gifted with on this planet, you're spending that doing something you hate, showing up to a job that you hate, on a commute that you hate, working with people that you hate. That's the death cycle. That's why I'm an advocate of entrepreneurship, and that's why I wrote the book, Nothing to Lose. <laughs>